I'm Jim. And I'm Garrett. And this is Jim, Jim and Garrett, Garrett at the Movies. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Jim and Garrett at the Movies. We will be talking El Camino, the Breaking Bad movie coming out on Netflix. We're pairing that, of course, with Hell or High Water. And then uh, we'll be discussing the latest Star Wars news. But first, El Camino picks up exactly where Breaking Bad, the series, left off. Breaking Bad, of course, one of the best television series of all time, for my money. Uh, this is uh, Rince Gilligan returns as director and writer, and it stars Aaron Paul. It picks up the story of Jesse Pinkman after the end of the series um, and his escape. Uh, so, Garrett, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, this might be a minor spoiler. Spoiler when I give my one sentence review for this film, but so be it. Um, it's everything that I liked about this series, but also uh, exactly how I thought things would go. What about you? Uh, that's a sort of an interesting uh, 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 one sentence review. I never thought about how things would go. I loved the ending of Breaking Bad so much. I I just let it be what it was and, and did not allow my imagination to say, what next? Uh, and I sort of figured that when Vince Gilligan ended the series in 2015, I think it was, um, uh, uh, that's sort of you know, where, where he was at, too, that, 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 that it reached its sort of natural closing place um, and, and the, the, the characters could be and the universe could be let go. Apparently, you know, a year or so ago or whatever, Vince Gilligan started to get a, a, a bug in his ear about what happened next with uh, with Jesse and decided to, to come back and revisit it. And all the relevant parties were on board. And uh, so, yeah, it's um, I would say that uh, El Camino is pretty much on par with, you know, a, a middle grade Breaking Bad episode, which is to say it's good. It's 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 watchable. You know, it's interesting. It's well made. It doesn't feel like a feature film. It feels like a two hour long Breaking Bad episode. But that's not a criticism in terms of quality. That's that's something I want to sit down and watch. If Vince Gilligan decides to do another two hour uh, Breaking Bad film of some variety, I want to sit down and watch that, too. Um, all that having been said, I think it, it, this film wasn't really necessary uh again that's i don't that's not a criticism again it's ju it's just to say that to, you know the, the 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 main arc of the story had ran its course this is at best a postscript um and while it's a well-made postscript and interesting and uh, and i think aaron paul is gets right back into the groove of the character of jesse pinkman um and and that's a groove i like being in that's a place i want to spend time but at the same time, uh, there's no grand revelations. It's, it's not going to transform or change the way you saw Breaking Bad or even necessarily shed any more light in particular on uh, any real aspects of it that you may have already missed. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's good. I'm glad. I enjoyed it. But uh, at the same time, if someone skips it, I'm not going to say that they're missing it. If they skip Breaking Bad, I'm going to say they're fucking crazy. And they should re reconsider their life priorities at that point. And, <laughs> and, 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 and maybe quit their job and go home and just watch Breaking Bad straight through. That's because it, yeah, no. that's how good Breaking Bad is. I... Oh, Camino, what's it going? Yeah, it's, it's good. It's exactly how I thought that it would be. Um, uh, when Jesse Pinkman drove out into the night screaming, this is what I thought his next, uh, his next adventures would be. Um, this is precisely the aspects of his life that I thought would occur. And so I almost, I agree with you when you say it's almost unnecessary because this is what I thought it would be. Um, that said, it is compelling it is a masterclass in developing tension. It's a masterclass in um, character interactions and not thinking of characters as disposable. I think a lot of the action films and uh, horror films and other sort of genre films that we're getting these days almost think of characters and as disposable and therefore to some degree paint their protagonists as, as uh, you know, uh, cold-hearted killers in some ways. It's really, uh, you know, it, especially if you kind of visit the 
uh, action films of the 90s. They're, all of the protagonists are, are uh, think of think of taking a human life as kind of another day at the job. And here it is, it, it's, it's dealt with, with adequate and appropriate gravity. And I think that that is uh, a highlight of Vince Gilligan's writing and directing and why Breaking Bad works so well, because it was a television series that never considered its characters disposable, never considered it, it sort of has a respect for life in an odd way. Um, and and I really like that about this film. Um, and, and of course, the filmmaking and the tension that that gets built up from scene to scene. Uh, which I, you know, we won't go into those specific scenes um, here because of spoilers. But I think that, uh, nevertheless, this is it, it's a film that once you watch it, you are engrossed in the scene to scene aspects of the film. Even though the film writ large, after you turn it off, is like, okay, this is exactly what I thought it would be. And I think uh, a a comparison to a long Breaking Bad episode is is right on as well. So um, mostly agreement, um, but I did want to sort of delve into some of the things I liked as on a, on a more nuanced level. Yeah, I think that uh, part of what can make, can illustrate why this is a little less satisfying than, than Breaking Bad as a series is because one of the things that Breaking Bad did absolutely masterfully was the use of separate elements that were tracked over across episodes, sometimes even across seasons. Uh, things would be introduced that would seem mild or inconsequential, like uh, the, the signing of the Walt Whitman book, which ends up being one of the major turns of the story, or the, the, the mysterious rice and cigarette, uh, uh, which ends up cutting across several different episodes and transforming character motivations in incredibly consequential ways. And the show managed to put these elements in play, make you forget about them, and then remind you right when it needed to. Uh, and and that, that juggling, that keeping those different elements in the air and drawing them down out of the air exactly when they were needed to be in a way that was perfectly organic, didn't feel forced or artificial or like it was you know, uh, overly scripted or anything like that, uh, but, but managed to work incredibly powerfully to drive the story forward, to change its direction, to change relationships between characters. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, I... I, from a writing point of view, I have difficulty thinking of anything else to compare it to. Um, the only thing again, I, I would say is The Shield is the only other show I can think that that managed to pull that 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 those kind of elements off quite so well. Um, so uh, while that's fat, phenomenal for the show, the film doesn't have that kind of legroom. It doesn't have that the, the breathing space to put that many different things up in the air. So instead, it focuses on on what it can handle in two hours. And what it can handle in two hours is, as you say, it's the the, the tension, the drama. Uh, 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 all that sort of the, the very good sort of technical filmmaking uh, that, that's in there. Um, so it's uh, uh, it, it, it's again it, it's it's a strange kind of criticism because what I'm basically saying is it's not as good as the show overall, but that's only because the show overall is so fucking good. Right. Yeah, I uh, I generally agree with all of that. I mean, it is kind of interesting to reflect, and the film allows you to do that. Reflect on how far these characters have come, mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly Jesse, most importantly in Jesse. Uh, you know, he, where he starts and where he ends up are, that's such a compelling arc and, yeah. and so beautifully handled. And, and so, I, you know, I guess for viewers watching this, if this is your first Breaking Bad uh, experience, then I don't know if this film is going to work for you except on a scene-to-scene -scene level. Um, except on a level of this is how you build tension, this is how you, uh, you know, how you do character interactions within these scenes, um, on and on and on. I think that I think that's all good. But in order to get the broader scope of this, I think you need to have seen the series. Yeah, seeing this film before seeing Breaking Bad as a series would, to my mind, be a terrible mistake. Um, part of what makes the ending of Breaking Bad so effective is that it's you don't see it coming. It's not like a twist. It's not like some sort of shyamalan and sort of uh, a, a, a version or something like that of expectations. But uh, you know, Vince Gilligan and his writing crew managed to paint characters into corners that there's no obvious way to get out of. And then once you see how they pull that off, 
uh, it makes perfect sense. And, and and to rob yourself of the joy of traveling through those corners uh, uh, would be would be a terrible sadness. Not that you wouldn't enjoy, I think, El Camino for its own rights, like you say, principally on a scene to scene basis. Um, but it would in many ways spoil the series. So yeah. Uh, so what do you give it out of five? Three and a half. I am the same. Three and a half stars for me too. It's a recommend, but only for. Uh, those people who have seen the series. Uh, let's move on to our paired movie, and that is Hell or High Water, the 2016 David McKenzie directed Sh- Tyler Sheridan written film starring Chris Pine and Ben Foster and Jeff Bridges. This rivaled, uh, this was one of my favorite movies of that year. Um, it's about a team of brothers who go bank robbing and a sheriff who is pursuing them what do you uh what do you think about hell or high water i loved it when i first saw it and i loved it when i rewatched it this is a film that you know i i can't think of anything critical to say about it. and you know me i'm a nitpicker i'll i'll dig in and i'll find say oh, there's mistakes here flaws here but every single part of this thing worked. The, the acting, the cinematography, the music, the, the, the screenplay, the, the, the general direction, the tone, the themes, uh, the relationship between the characters. It, 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 they all hit the notes exactly where they need to be. And I, you know, it, it's the rare film where I, I, would, I can't think of anything that I would want done better or change about it. And that's a rare accomplishment in filmmaking. I think that the the ending of the film I found slightly I I it it almost dipped its toes into some clichés. I mean there's a particular shot of Ben Foster with a machine gun that was sort of ripped out of the Predator or something along those lines. It's a it's one of those shots where it's a hero shot and he's he's got a uh a machine gun and some sunglasses and he's just doing some shit and uh it's it's badass and it's cool but it it that was one moment where i thought that the film kind of shifted tones i think in the third act it shifts tones away from this this truly realistic uh gritty drama action you know mystery film and and then turns into something that it wasn't beforehand. So that is literally my only criticism, and that's a minor criticism, especially given uh, how much this, how intricately this film is plotted, how well it is done over the, co- on, you know, from a scene to scene basis, of course, but also the in a broader scope, this does what El Camino doesn't, and that is build character over the course of two hours rather than over the course of five seasons of television in two hours. This, these characters are nuanced. These characters are fully realized. These characters are people that you come to know and love, even though uh, there's, and, and, and it's the, the drama is how are you going to sympathize with the Chris Pine, Ben Foster character? And of course, uh, you know, at the in in the end, it it ends up being a very sympathetic set of crimes, and I find that to be I that's sort of a a writer's magic trick, and I think Tyler Sheridan is I, I mean he did uh, another film the uh, the Jeremy Renner film that I liked a lot more than um, most other people Wind River, um, and so I think it all speaks to Tyler Sheridan is an excellent screenwriter. Yeah, I, he clearly has a sensibility about him. Uh, he, he does sort of modern westerns quite well. Right. Um, and, and sort of, you know, neo-noirish uh, westerns, something along those lines. Um, uh, it, it's a place where he feels at home. Um, and I think that uh, this is definitely his, uh, the, the best effort, at least of the ones of his that, that, that I've seen. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's timely. It plays in, obviously, to sort of bank closures which i suppose maybe that's not timely maybe that's that's uh-huh. time less perhaps in a certain sense tragically um but uh, uh, uh it's more timely at certain points than others um and you know there, there's a kind of bonnie and clyde-esque feel to uh to 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 the idea again of sympathizing with bank robbers um and and i gotta say i uh, i mean yeah uh, i 
not much of a fan of Chris Pine as an actor overall. I think he's done a lot of fine movies, but you know, I, I don't find his performances generally to be particularly superlative. But he is fantastic in this. He absolutely nails it. And the relationship he has with Ben Foster, who was also fantastic. I, I'm a huge fan of Ben Foster. He's an excellent actor. Um, uh, and he's excellent in pretty much everything. Um, but he's also excellent in this. And, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship between the brothers, you know, I mean, a, a, a brother relationship is, you know, a difficult one sort of to pull off, I think, without devolving into, into cliches, um, w without, uh, 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 you know, falling it, it, down a hole of, you know, this is what, what brothers on film are supposed to look like, not this is what brothers in the real world actually are. Um, and I think the chemistry and the relationship that they have as brothers feels so real it feels like they are actually you know they grew up together fighting with each other and loving each other um and, and the film is unapologetic about that relationship and that that that's that it, it works really well i can't agree with you more and a brief uh, correction i might have said tyler sheridan it's taylor sheridan uh who's the director so i might have made a mistake there uh but right, yes right. i couldn't what Taylor Sheridan's the writer, the David McKay. Taylor Taylor Sheridan's the writer. Yes, I'm sorry. I might have said Tyler Sheridan as the writer, and it's Taylor. Anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the brother relationship here is absolutely perfect. Uh, you could tell that these are uh, that they've sort of fallen into their their patterns. They know each other very well. Um, I think it works wonderfully. And of course, uh, Jeff Bridges' uh, relationship with his his cohort, um, I, I forget the character's name, um, Alberto Parker, um, I believe, uh, played by uh, Gil Birmingham, um, also quite good as well. So I, I think this is this works as a nice foil between the two of them, uh, between the two pairs, and it it's it's a brilliant movie, and uh, I really. I think that this is one of those films that reinvents the Western in a way that Wind River, I felt, did as well. And Sicario, um, Taylor Sheridan, you know, one of those writers to watch. We'll have a conversation about Wind River another time. Um, <laughs> uh, there are many strengths of that film, don't get me wrong, but it also has, in my opinion, one major flaw. But that's that's another episode that's not this episode. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, what would you give uh, Hell or High Water out of five? Four stars. Four stars from me, too. It was almost the best film of 2016, and then we both saw Silence. Um, let us move on to our news item. Uh, David... L David Benioff and D.B. Wise are out of the new Star Wars trilogy. Uh, they were slated to be doing a Star Wars trilogy that would come out after the rise of this year's Rise of Skywalker, and uh, they are no longer doing that. They have suggested that in a statement, they said that they will be concentrating on the uh, requirements of their $250 million Netflix deal that they were, um, that they were signed onto and are dropping out of the Star Wars franchise. Um, what was your first reaction to this news, Garrett? Uh, I mean, I have a lot of friends who were thrilled at this, uh, who these were not coincidentally the friends who were really dissatisfied with the final season of Game of Thrones. Uh, so I can understand their happiness uh, at, at, at not wanting to have something that they view as sort of as, as a tainted, cre tainted creative team uh, working on uh, one of their favorite properties. At the same time, in my mind, I think that the final season of Game of Thrones is about on par with the last couple of Star Wars films, uh, in my mind. So I wouldn't have minded. I, I, I was curious where they were going to go. At the same time, I can't really be too disappointed because it's not like they're not going to make more Star Wars films. They're just going to get different people to helm them. And whether or not they're going to be any good, of course, will depend on precisely who they get to helm them. Uh, yeah, there's also the fact that I think it was Kathleen Kennedy or someone at least that sort of left the door open that if, if, if the two of them want to come back at some future date and work, then uh, they'd, they'd be invited to, which uh, means that maybe we'll get to see it yet. Um, personally, I don't I, I, I don't know any of the details of what their Netflix deal involves specifically, but you know if, if I had sort of a, a, the blank check that they have to, to, to do whatever I want at Netflix or to create a Star Wars trilogy... I think I'd be going for the Star Wars trilogy myself, but then again, maybe they got other ideas. Maybe uh, there, there's reasons uh, that I'm unaware of. 
Well, there was a there was an interview that came out not too long ago with Benioff and Weiss that was not particularly flattering. Um, it suggested that they were sort of shell shocked and not really prepared to begin Game of Thrones and kind of stumbled on the Game of Thrones uh, show running uh, their their career as sort of a ten years of of running sh- um, Game of Thrones, and then it wasn't. It wasn't particularly a an interview that painted them as perfectly prepared to be doing those things. Then, of course, you get uh, George R. Martin falling behind in the books, and uh, they uh, are thrust into the unfortunate position of having to uh, almost write original content for Game of Thrones, which they didn't originally sign on to do. I mean, imagine they they sign you on and they're like, we're going to adapt, adapt these books. OK, got it. Um, oh, and also you are going to conclude this decade long uh, series that people are totally invested in and you have to connect all of the dots because the books have disappeared. Um, that's sort of like... Uh, a, you know, a trapeze artist with a net suddenly gone um, or to steal a line from the big kahuna. We're going to throw you off a cliff and see if you can fly. Um, so they, they it's a tough thing. And then, of course, they got all of the social media bl- backlash associated with the Game of Thrones season. And then they're entering into this fandom, the Star Wars fandom, that is not particularly kind to new things as as Ryan Johnson, who is also developing a Star Wars trilogy of his own, uh, as Ryan Johnson could attest to. I you know, this seems to me uh, it, it it sparks of a move, a pullout that is almost inspired by a kind of fear. Um, and whether that fear is is founded or unwarranted, is is a different question but i have some sympathy for it even if uh even if it it deprives us of the benioff and weiss star wars trilogy yeah that's an interesting take um i i likewise can sort of sympathize with that fear uh it, it's a difficult position to be in because on the one hand you do want people who are sort of taking the reins of such an established universe to be responsive to 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 fans to to to, to treat the property that they love with respect uh, and to not do something with it which completely sort of destroys or undermines or, or, or transforms the thing that they love in, into something that they hate uh, so you want to be respect receptive to the fans at the same time I think if uh, if the last few Star Wars films have taught us anything it's that there's a lot of Star Wars fans out there that are a bunch of whiny little bitches and <laughs> they just just are so entitled and so full of themselves and uh you know it makes it hard to have any kind of criticisms of star wars for fear that you're going to be limp, lumped in with those fucking people um trigger so, warning for star wars fans <laughs> yeah. so yeah uh if you are correct i i can sympathize and i can understand um uh it's not like making your entirely own creative universe where if you fuck it up the only people who you're sort of accountable to is yourself as an artist um and the, that's a that's a fear that I think a lot of artists are are more comfortable with. And so it makes sense that they would move toward that type of fear rather than uh, the fear associated with adapting two franchises now to, fran- you know, Star Wars and Game of Thrones that that fans have a, such a vested interest in. And if you do one wrong move, if if Tyrion's hair is in the wrong place, they're gonna they're gonna yell at you about it. Uh, I can, Starbucks cup out. Right. Well, that's just fucking lazy. I, I you know I if anything, I'm surprised that that was uh, not digitally edited away. But anyway, it, it was actually after after it was caught. The the, oh, the, the, the the digital reruns have it removed. So so that means that means that they didn't even catch it in post, which. Yeah is a bit surprising. Um, and there's a water bottle as well uh, that that made it onto the set. So that's, it's a little upsetting. But um, regardless, I am, uh, I you know, they've lived a privileged uh, existence. Uh, they've had a privileged career and uh, they will continue to have a privileged career on Netflix. Um, just probably not with the Star Wars universe, which I'm kind of okay with. 
Um, I I am not as down on the final season of Game of Thrones as everybody else, but I certainly understand that uh, Benioff and Weiss, once they are solely responsible for a thing, um, it's it's not always the best uh, the best product. And all we really want to see is good movies. All we really want to see is good art. So, um, any further comments on the Benioff and Weiss drama? Yeah, I mean, just that that last comment there. I I I think that uh, they they've been unfairly maligned by a lot of this backlash. Um, I think that it's really hard to end Game of Thrones. Uh, and while you know a whole bunch of people got a bunch of ideas about how they wanted to see it end and stuff like that, I'm pretty sure that 99 out of 100 proposals would have been much worse than what we actually got. Sure. Um, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they're you know, you know, uh, godlike geniuses or anything like that. But uh, uh, I, I'm on board for whatever it is that they do next. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna uh, mortgage my house to be first in line for whatever it is. But uh, I'm definitely gonna check it out. So you're not gonna quit your job and watch all of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. So join us. That is that is this week's episode. Join us next week when we will be talking about the current war, the director's cut. And yes, we will go over all of the off-screen drama accord, uh, associated with that film. And uh, we will be pairing that, of course, with the uh, great Christopher Nolan film, The Prestige. So current war director's cut and The Prestige next week. Until then, I am Jim. And I'm Garrett. And this has been Jim and Garrett Garrett at the the movies. movies. Good night.